morning. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Terry Audla, president of the Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, or ITK. ITK represents 55,000 Inuit people across Nunavut, Nunavik, Northern Quebec, Nunatsiavut, Northern Labrador, and the Inuvialuit settlement region across the Northwest Territories. Terry was born in Iqaluit, which was formerly known as Frobisher Bay, raised in Resolute Bay by parents who were high Arctic exiles, who were relocated from Inuktuak, Quebec in the early 1950s. Terry has expertise in the implementation of Inuit land claims, land claims agreements, and in growing economic opportunities for the Inuit. Terry bridges cultures in his work. One way is through helping develop a common Inuktitut terminology for lands management. He was elected to a three-year term as president of Inuit Tapirit Kanatami in June 2012, so this means that he has just finished his first year in that role. It is our honor to be at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission All Parties meeting with Terry, who brings vital and significant perspective and insight to our work together. Please welcome Mr. Terry Audla. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to, to have been welcomed here, and uh, I welcome also the delegation here to Ottawa, uh, where I've been based for, for the past year or so. Uh, normally, I try and uh, open up my speaking with a uh, little anecdotal, ice-breaking uh, uh, tidbits of information. And uh, this particular one uh, involved me living in Iqaluit um, a few years ago, and I had neglected to renew my license and registration for my vehicle, um, turning left, or sorry, turning right into work. Um, I had signaled and I was driving a vehicle that was not necessarily legal. But uh, uh, this snowmobile came racing down my right side and it smacked right into me. And the driver was laying prone, unconscious on the ground. Uh, thankfully, he was wearing a helmet. And in my panic, I was looking at him, and all I could think about was my license and registration. Uh, I ran into the office building, told the receptionist, call the ambulance. And this white-haired fellow came following in, handed me his card, and said, I saw what happened. You were not at fault. He was coming like a bat out of hell. I have to catch my plane, but here's my card if you, if you need uh, a witness. And he. he sped off. I just put the card in, uh, in my pocket, didn't bother looking at it. And the police came and the ambulance came and I fished out the, the card. Thank God it was the Archbishop of the Arctic who gave me his card. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Archbishop, I, I can't recall his name right now, but he, he uh, preceded uh, Paul Idlaut and my uncle Andrew at the Gutaluk. So um, the, after the police saw that card, they didn't ask for my li license or registration. <laughs> and worked out okay, and, and the guy survived. He, he was hospitalized for the day, but he no broken bones or anything like that. So it worked out well. Uh, Bishop Johnson, Archbishop Hiltz, members of the Joint Assembly, honored guests and visitors, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today at this first gathering of members of the Anglican Church of Canada and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. I had the pleasure of meeting Archbishop Hiltz early this year at a meeting of the All Party to the Residential School Settlement Agreement. The process of truth-telling and reconciliation that has unfolded over the past several years 
between churches, governments, and Aboriginal peoples has made great progress in overcoming the tragic legacy of the residential school system. But reconciliation is an evolving process. And so Archbishop Hiltz asked me here today to tell you a little bit about the Inuit of Canada and our historical relationship with the church, both the legacy of residential schools and the positive relationship that has existed between us throughout time. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the organization I represent, Inuit Tapari Kanatami, and giving you a quick lesson in Inuktitut. In our language, Inuit Tapari Kanatami means Inuit are united in Canada. Our work at ITK centers on ensuring that Inuit interests are reflected in national policy making affecting the Arctic. I'll refer more specifically to that work a little later in my remarks. We inhabit a region of Arctic Canada we call Inuit Nunangat, the Inuit homeland. And uh, the map you saw uh, previously uh, is the area that, uh, that the Inuit live in. Um, the, during my introduction, she had mentioned uh, 55,000 Inuit. We've since grown uh, to 59,000. And uh, it is a, a high birth rate uh, within our population. And, uh, the Inuit numbers are growing, uh, but the numbers are still uh, small enough that sometimes we're considered not significant enough um, when it comes to representation at the federal level, um, based on the fact that we, our numbers are so few. But uh, a lot of people forget about the, pack, the fact that uh, we cover an area that's two-fifths the land mass of Canada, and that we hunt off the coast, which represents two-fifths the coastline of Canada. You, you probably notice a trend from coast to coast to coast, uh, and there is um, uh, growing interest in, in our region, in our, in our Arctic, based on climate change, based on the global, um, I guess, collective guilt among themselves that they've been uh, uh, contributing to the climate change, to, to the, the greenhouse gases. So in their misinformed ways, they've been trying to save the Arctic by concentrating specifically on the Arctic and not including the Inuit, the people that live in the Arctic, who know best how to live in that environment, how to adapt, and how to manage their wildlife. So we, we are still fundament, fundamentally a hunting and trapping society, a people of the snow and ice, and that remains as true today as it was 100 years ago. As previously mentioned, I grew up in the high Arctic in the Nunavut community of Khausuitu, Resolute Bay. I am baptized and confirmed Anglican, though I think I would be a better churchgoer if the choir at my church could hold a tune. A friend and I have often joked, who happens to be the son of uh, uh, Art, the Bishop of the Arctic, Andrew Atagutaluk, Eric, often joke about starting our own church, one with a headlining choir. Some of our most talented performers, Susan Agluka and Beatrice Deer among them, got their start in church choirs, and that's a tradition worth preserving. So I say to you all, bring in a voice coach, someone that can help our choirs. <laughs> Inuit have a long relationship with the church. In the beginning, this relationship was in many ways an extension of our colonization. There's a great deal of scholarly debate about the relationship between evangelicalism and assimilation. Missionaries were the authority figures in our communities and peoples of my parents' and grandparents' generation felt duty-bound to obey their every word. These church leaders provided for our spiritual needs, but they, they, along with the Hudson's Bay Company traders, were also our teachers, our judges, and in some cases, our dentists. We jokingly refer to the Hudson's Bay Company as here before Christ. <laughs> That's how things began. Over time, something very special began to happen. Inuit started taking ownership of this faith 
and became missionaries in their own right. They spread the word of God to their fellow Inuit, and in that way, Christianity took hold throughout the Arctic quickly and completely. Despite everything that has happened between those early times and today, Inuit remain firmly and resolutely Christian. Our faith in God helps us overcome obstacles, support us as we heal, and allows us to see a better future for ourselves and our families. Of course, there is still a great deal of anger among some Inuit for the horrors of residential school and the legacy of those atrocities across generations. That anger, for the most part, is not directed at God so much as the human beings directly responsible for those crimes. So our relationship with the church continues to evolve. While at one time we, have, we may have followed blindly the word of missionaries, today we have embraced the freedom to think freely and to make our own choices. And that's having a positive effect on the place of Christianity in our society. We see it in the number of Inuit who have become leaders in the church, from priests to deacons to our own, my own uncle, Andrew Atagutaluk, the first bishop of the Arctic, who happens to be my uncle. We can't discuss the relationship between Inuit and the church without mentioning the Reverend Jonas Alulu and his team of Anglican ministers. Just last year, this group completed the first mother tongue translation of the Bible, the first translation completed by Inuit clergymen whose first language is Inuktitut. We'll be hearing from Jonas in a few moments, uh, but first I would like to commend him personally for this incredible achievement that allows us to speak with God in the language of the Inuit. We have the church to thank for, for the written form of Inuktitut. Reverend Edmund Peck developed syllabic system, a syllabic system still used in Nunavut and Nunavik today. Moravian missionaries in Labrador were among the first to translate the New Testament into Inuktitut. These early missionaries taught us to read and write our language, a gift that has, that has kept Inuktitut alive as hundreds of indigenous languages in Canada have simply faded away. Reverend Alulu work his work continues this tradition of language development and preservation that is essential if we are to maintain Inuktitut as a working language of the Inuit society. The other gift we were given by early missionaries is closely related to these teachings on language. Missionaries, missionaries together with the government, introduced us to the system of formalized education. That's a tough legacy to overcome, but it is beginning to happen. Slowly but surely, we are rebuilding our education systems in this post-residential schools era. In 2011, ITK launched a national strategy on Inuit education, the first of its kind to look at the Inuit system as a whole, spread out across two provinces and two territories. Just a few months ago, we opened the Mayak National Center for Inuit Education, a division of ITK charged with implementing the recommendations of the strategy. Our priorities include re-engaging parents who have lost faith, lost faith in the school system, perhaps because of their own experiences in the residential school. Parental engagement is an essential component of student success, and we want to make parents partners in this new Inuit-driven transformation. Another project concerns exploring the ideas of a standardized Inuktitut writing system. Reverend Peck, gave us a syllabic system based on the Cree writing system. Missionaries who visited our eastern and westernmost communities taught Inuit to write using the Roman, the Roman alphabet, Roman orthography. The result is a dual orthography that makes it difficult and expensive for us to share printed works across our homeland and with Inuit living in other countries. This too is un undergoing a process of change. We need your support in undertaking these initiatives. They are part of a process of taking control of our society, and they are part of a larger process of reconciliation. That's not the only area in which we can work together. Uh, I was particularly interested to see that you have been discussing issues such as homelessness and responsible resource development during this assembly. Resource development is another way that we seek to move forward in partnership with others for the betterment of our communities. As we are taking control 
of language and education, so too are, are we taking control of our land through comprehensive land claims agreements and cooperative management systems. Keep in mind that these are very recent uh, land claims agreements. They're, they're unlike the, the, the numbered treaties in, in other parts of Canada. They're quite comprehensive. And that it, it protects our way of life in the sense that we can still hunt and conserve the, the wildlife that we rely on in partnership with government. And also that we be meaningful partners in major projects, which means that we are employees as well as the employers. And at the same time, we are protectors of the land that we rely on for our food. If we didn't have the traditional food that Inuit rely on right now, of which is, comprises about two thirds, we'd see third world situations in Northern Canada, just based on the how difficult it is to ship anything up north, how expensive it is. Overcrowded housing, contamination of our wildlife and their habitat, and the tragic rate of suicide among our children remain core issues with which we continue to struggle. Bottled water runs $100 a case in some communities. A watermelon would cost half a day's wages. I could fly around the world for the amount it costs to visit my family in Resolute Bay. There are great inequalities between North and South. Awareness goes a long way in closing these gaps. I don't know if you guys remember the show, or I believe it's still on. Rick Mercer's The Sour has 22 minutes, where he goes south of the border, and it's called Talking to Americans. The further north you live, the more geographic, geographically aware you are. It's uh, surprising to me sometimes that my fellow Canadians in southern Canada know very little about their north, and that not a lot of people realize that Canada is longer than it is wider. So that's one thing to keep in mind, and I hope that if you're sitting here there wondering what you can do, how you can become engaged in our work and our communities, the simple answer is to become better informed about your Arctic and the Inuit way of life. Take an interest in the contributions we have made and continue to make. Become an advocate for change. Don't rely on the stereotypes. Help us let the world know, for example, that we are still hunters and we know the best way to preserve the wildlife. Most animal rights activists have, have likely never been to the Arctic and conservation of polar bears, for example, is best left to those of us who live among them. For those of you who know the Arctic well, your friendship is invaluable. And I'll conclude this, uh, my speaking, uh, with a creed that I, I, I try to live by, and that's John chapter eight, verse seven. Most of you are aware of what, what that refers to. And for me, I, I shy away from judgment. I shy away from giving my preconceived ideas upon an individual. I always give the benefit of the doubt. Another part is that humility is, is a big part of how I do things. Um, I try to remain humble. I admit to mistakes. I learn from those mistakes. I don't fault anyone for my mistakes, and I stick to that. That's the message I would like to leave with you today. We are a blended family of traditions and history, and in spite of everything, we are better for having known each other. We continue to grow together and struggle and learn with no one in sight and no limit to the possibilities. Thank you.